4 AD. It's now about eight years after Paul left Ephesus, after his three-year sojourn there. And Paul is getting on, on in age now. He, he himself is in Macedonia, but his representative Timothy is in Ephesus. And by all accounts, young Timothy was undergoing a pretty torrid time. Poor Tim. The church in Ephesus was made up of small groups of believers throughout the city. And each group had a leader with some experience, knowledge, and therefore they had some influence. So you can imagine the turmoil if their understanding of the gospel should become twisted uh, and somehow infected with false teachings and myths. The turmoil would act like a virus going from group to group and from person to person. And the records that we have of the early church show that when false teaching had been encountered elsewhere, it had come in from outside of the church. But in Ephesus it was different because the false teachers had come from within the church itself, even from some of the house leaders that Paul had helped set up. But was Paul surprised? Not at all. We read in Acts chapter 20, written much earlier than this letter, Paul saying this, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, people will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you, night and day, with tears. So Paul wasn't surprised in the least. He knew what was coming. And so in this letter, Paul has delegated his authority to young Timothy. Timothy is encouraged to counter with sound doctrine, the, the false teaching, particularly in regards to Mosaic law. And it seems from this letter that the, the leaders were mixing Jewish ideas and pagan myths into Christian thought. That wouldn't happen today either, would it? And we read about those things in verses 3 and 4. False doctrines any longer. Devote, don't devote yourselves to myths and endless genealogies. They were distracting the church from the work that it had to do for God. And they were promoting fantasy, controversy and meaningless talk. Again, that wouldn't happen today in churches, would it? So Paul writes to Timothy. He's already written his letter to the church in Ephesus. That was a few years ago now. This letter is a personal one to Timothy, written to bolster Timothy's authority and position within the Ephesus community, and particularly towards those who were spreading this particular uh, false teaching. Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus, I, Paul, am an apostle chosen by God, and I'm an apostle because God has commanded me to be so. Timothy is my ambassador. Timothy is my man for the job, so wise up, you silly Ephesians. Listen to him, and you won't go astray from the truth. So let's have a look at the church. We'll read again from verses 4 to 11. Or 5 to 11. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some of you have wandered away from these and turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they are so uh, confidently affirming. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the uh, sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. So some leaders within this house church movement in Ephesus were teaching doctrines contrary to that of Paul. They were being troublemakers, causing rebelliousness and dissent. And the NIV, as we've read, translated as false doctrine. But another translation could be a different doctrine, from my limited understanding of Greek. 
And it was different, as in different from fundamental apostolic teaching. These people were mixing myths and legends in with solid apostolic doctrine. It led them to teach a different Jesus, making a Jesus who was different from the authentic Jesus of Paul and the apostles. The authentic Jesus, who was fully human and fully God. So again, does that sound familiar to what we hear in some churches today? It was also the desire of these troublemakers to inflict a form of Judaism and legalism upon the church, where a number of Jewish ceremonies were seen to be still binding upon the Christian, therefore making a gospel of works rather than a gospel of grace. They were saying that for Jewish people, genealogies were important, particularly as they linked them back to Abraham, because by doing so their salvation was guaranteed. Kind of false gospel in the light of Jesus Christ and his salvation work on the cross. But Paul says here that any reliance on genealogies is useless. It's unreliable. Genealogies don't promote good work and a good conscience. He says to them to rely on genealogies for salvation is a gospel of works, as opposed to a gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ, which is salvation based on grace alone through faith alone. These false teachers were promoting their own glory rather than seeking the glory of Jesus Christ alone. They were leading people out of the security and freedom of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and into an insecure salvation based on works, through those same genealogies. These false teachers were without these things. They didn't have a sincere faith, nor did they have pure hearts or good consciences. These people had wandered from the true gospel as taught by Jesus and were dragging others away with them. Again, sounds like parts of the church to me today. And these people were abusing the law rather than teaching it. Instead, Paul explains to Timothy about the law and that the law is indeed good. He explains that the proper use of the law is to restrain people from doing evil. That laws and and law, rules are not for those who are obedient, but to correct and train those who are disobedient. The law can't save anybody, Paul says, but only reveal their need of a saviour. And in verses 9 to 11, Paul gives some examples of those who are breaking the law willfully. So it's into this mix that young Timothy is thrown. Lucky Timothy, huh? Ah, young Timothy. He was the son of a Jewess and his father was a Gentile. Timothy was converted to Christianity early on in his life and he was taken by Paul to assist him on his work for the Gospel. In particular to encourage the new churches that were sprouting up everywhere. And as we said, Timothy here in Ephesus is instructed by Paul to keep fighting the good fight and to keep battling the false teachers. We read that in verse 18 and 19. I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you might fight, fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Timothy, and therefore the church in Ephesus, had a choice to make. They could keep following Paul and accept his wisdom, or they could succumb to the wiles and the whims of these false teachers. Timothy was probably quite a timid lad, and he had been instructed to silence the troublemakers, yet he would also be feeling the pressure to conform to the whims of these very same troublemakers. What is Timothy to do? He has a choice to make. Timothy is instructed here to remember what was told him in the past. He, Timothy, was set aside for ministry and he is commanded to keep going and to persevere. He has a moral obligation and duty to do it, as Paul has instructed him, to fight and defend the liberating truth about Jesus against the error-filled agitators. So how is Timothy to do, things, do this? Well, Timothy has two things of great worth, says Paul. He has the objectivity of an apostolic faith, and he also has the subjectivity 
of a good conscience. Apostolic faith is belief, and a good conscience is action. If Timothy holds on and uses both of them, he will have fought that good fight of faith. And by preserving a good conscience, Timothy will keep the faith. And by remembering what he believes is apostolic truth, Timothy will be reminded to behave correctly. Belief and behaviour are co-joined. What is truly believed will affect behaviour. That is where we are told in verse 20, Alex, Alexander and Amenius had gone wrong. Their apostasy and behaviour were so bad that Paul had to exert church discipline against them. And as radical as it seems today, remember that the church is still in its infancy. It is in a developing state. Was this excommunication permanent? Well, it seems by the use of the word taught, they could be welcomed back if they were willing to truly repent, to learn, and then be restored. So that's Timothy. But what do we learn here of Paul? Before we go on to learn more about God. Ah, Paul. Hmm. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Saviour and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, Grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Then from verse 12 he goes, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Paul, we know, is an apostle. He's been set apart for this role by God and by Jesus the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can see Paul's passion for God exuding from him, even as you read these letters. Whatever Paul does for the glory of God is because God himself is strengthening him. Paul, once an opponent and oppressor of Jesus and his church, is now a dynamic servant of this same Jesus. What a turnaround. And Paul can't forget what he had done to the early church. When he, Paul, had persecuted it, and thereby also persecuted the church's head, Jesus. Paul can't forget how he was transformed from a, a violent sinner into a servant of Jesus. How did this come about? Well, it wasn't through Paul's own doing and strength but rather the inexhaustible patience and work of Jesus Christ. Perhaps that's something for us to remember, that God is being patient with us. Jesus Christ, transforming him via the, the twin wellsprings of God's boundless grace and infinite mercy. God's amazing grace and mercy so abundantly poured out upon Paul and indeed on all believers. Paul's faith and love are in and for Jesus Christ and him alone. And when Paul says he is the worst of sinners in verse 16, is that not a very personal statement to make? Because when each of us confesses our sin to God, we should all feel as if we are the worst of the worst. Or at least I know I do. So Paul is compelled and thrust forward not by his own strength, but solely by the, the Holy Spirit through the love of God and of Jesus Christ. Paul has a personal, intimate and dynamic relationship with God. He exudes this to Timothy. So I'm bound to ask, how is your relationship with God? Is it as intimate and dynamic as Paul writes here? Now the bit you've all been waiting for, Let's now talk about God. Verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy 
so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Wow. That's God. That's Paul's God. That's Timothy's God. This is the God the church in Ephesus professed to worship and follow, but were in danger of abandoning in pursuit of some kind of false God. The one holy and true God, as opposed to the different God proposed by the false teachers. And the first thing we see about God is in verse 1. God is a saving God. This God is also their saviour, Jesus Christ. This God is our hope, exclaims Paul. Forget that different God proposed by others. God alone is to be our hope, exclaims Paul. And this saving God of hope is an almighty God imbued with grace and mercy and peace. You read it through the chapter. And because of God's grace and mercy, Paul was now saved and one of God's servants and apostles. Mercy springing forth from grace. And because from God's mercy, there is grace at work, the forgiveness of sins. Without grace and mercy, peace with God is unobtainable. A God of mercy means that the follower of Jesus, the Christian, has a throne of grace to run to with boldness in order to seek the help of the great King of Majesty. That's what we'll be doing later in prayer. And the sound doctrine that Paul explains conforms to the blessed gospel and teaching of Jesus Christ rather than opposing it. Because of Jesus Christ, eternal, uh, eternal life is, is granted to those whose hope and faith is in him alone. Just as uh, Jesus was immensely patient with Paul, so he was with each of us who are Christians. Just as he is patient with those still outside the church in this community and not following him. Perhaps they are just waiting for a knock on the door or for someone to come up to them in the street and say, Hello. And now, now Paul explodes into a line of uh, complete adoration about God and exaltation of him. This God, this King, this Almighty is the eternal, immortal, invisible and only one. This God is before time, outside of time and after time. And what is more amazing is this, that this God entered into time and space of created and fallen humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, in order to save humanity, which was thoroughly incapable of saving itself. Forget genealogies, you troublemakers, you ear ticklers. There is no salvation or hope to be found in them. God's salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. Wow. Paul ecstatically exclaims that God is king, a mighty ruler, a majestic sovereign over all. This God has established a kingdom through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who lives within his people. And where the Holy Spirit is within you, so is the Father and so is the Son. This King is eternal. He is the King of all kings and the King of all the ages, past, present and future. Paul goes on, this God King was not bound by the unstable ebb and flow of Humanity's time fluctuations. God the King is of the ages and beyond the ages. Is that your view of God? This God, even more, this God is immortal beyond the ravages and decay of time. This God is incorruptible, imperishable, unchangeable and unchanging. This everlasting God is invisible beyond the scope of mortal humanity's vision. Yet... Yet humanity glimpsed his glory once, didn't they? When this God King, who is outside of both time and space, entered time and space in the God-man Jesus. This King is also the one and only God, who is the one and only great King. So Paul says to Timothy, don't let these foolish people go on any further. This great King 
is unique, majestic, and without rival or power. And because this king is eternal, immortal, invisible, and the only one, he alone is worthy of honour and glory. God, the king of holy majesty. What are you doing, you silly, foolish Ephesians, giving up this God to follow the false God being proposed by those amongst you? I bet they're glad Paul wasn't amongst them. And Paul goes on. Moreover, this amazing God is personal. Look at the personal pronouns Paul uses to describe the relationship with God. Verse 1, our Saviour, our hope. Verse 11, he entrusted to me. Verse 12, our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy has appointed me to his service. Verse 14, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love, which is a personal pronoun, that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, I was shown mercy so that in me Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So not only is this God almighty and awesome, he's also personal. So what? You might be thinking right now, what does all this mean for us some 2,000 years later? Or about 1,959. There you have it. It's 64 AD. The church in Ephesus is in a complete and utter mess. Timothy is drowning under the pressure. He's drowning, uh, he's uh, being, uh, succumbing to... Uh, conforming to the teachers and the whims of the false teachers and the false prophets who come from within the church. The Apostle Paul has heard about it, and he is therefore writing to encourage and instruct young Timothy. And young Timothy has a choice to make. He can succumb to the pressures thrust upon him by the false teachers and the troublemakers and the miscreants, and then go off and follow this false God, this false Jesus. Or Timothy can continue to follow the true God, the eternal, immortal, invisible, and only wise king of the apostolic doctrines as taught to him by Paul the Apostle by the command of God. What about us today? In a lot of churches today, the word doctrine is very unfashionable. I've had people say to me almost every week, our doctrine belongs to a time gone by and what we need are new experiences of God and miracles from God. That's the way forward for the church, they say. We hear it frequently. We're starting a new thing Come along. Is that new thing or that new way of thinking about God really of God? Is it promoting the Jesus of the Bible? Because I'm sure you're aware that's how the cult started, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. Supposedly a continuation of biblical Christianity. And for every Christian doctrine, what we think about God matters. If we have solid biblical doctrine being practiced in our life, then we will be seen to be living a life of total submission and obedience to Jesus. We'll be doing it to, for Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit to the praise of God the Father. If we put into practice what we truly believe about God, then we would be a changed people. This community, this nation would be turned upside for down for Jesus. Would it not? And as the mind is renewed, because it starts in the mind, and transformed with teaching about Jesus, we put it into practice what the mind learns. And the very life of the Christian is seen to be transformed into the image of Jesus. And then I find that people will ask questions quite naturally. Questions regarding the reason why you and I are so different. Of course, some are more different than others. But why are you being transformed? And what is the reason for the hope that you hold on to? That way the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ is spread 
for doctrine in practice is also evangelism. It's telling others about this wondrous one and only king who is eternal, immortal, invisible, yet made flesh in the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And another reason learning good doctrine is important is so that we can discern solid <coughs> teaching from the false teaching of heretics and those who want to lead Christians astray by knowing what is good and true about Jesus. We will be enabled to start discerning true beliefs from false beliefs and ultimately engage biblical doctrine into living a life worthy of Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about minor doctrinal issues such as communion and baptism, etc. But core doctrines such as God is Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The belief that Jesus was fully God and fully human. Or the belief that all of humanity has a fallen and sinful nature and is incapable of saving themselves. Some churches teach things that are totally the opposite of those apostolic truths. And they do it in a bid to be seen culturally relevant. Has the declaration about, from some churches about homosexuality not being sinful have its origins in the changing of some aspect of their doctrine concerning the holiness of God and the sinfulness of humanity? where they have a diminished view of the God of the Bible, which has inevitably led to a diminished and dumbed down view of sin, which in turn cheapens grace and the cost of it to God. Take for instance in recent years, these two men who were shining voices of evangelical Christianity, Rob Bell and Steve Chalk, both have dumbed down their doctrine to make it seemingly more palatable to those outside the church. Rob Bell by saying that one day everybody is going to be saved and on that final day because God is love and love wins. There is no hell or separation from God after death because love wins. Ear tickling. Is it not? Mm -hmm. And Steve Chalk, when he said that a God of love could never send his son to die on a cross as that would be a form of cosmic child abuse. Unsurprisingly, both Robin Bell, Rob Bell and Steve Chalk have come out in favour of gay marriage, despite what Jesus said about marriage being between man and woman alone. Just as Timothy had a choice to make, succumb to the troublemakers or submit to God, we also have choices to make in our daily life, both as individuals and as church. Do we conform to the world or do we conform to Jesus Christ? And we can conform to Jesus Christ because we've got the power of the Holy Spirit within us. If we do it in our own strength, we won't get very far. But we have the Holy Spirit within us. And yes, we are to be in the world, Jesus said, but we are not to take on the values of the world. That's a command of Jesus. And finally, you may be glad to know, I'll leave you with some questions. Both as individuals, this church, and for the wider church in the UK. Which gospel are we showing and telling others? Is it the gospel as explicitly given by Paul as expressed in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners? Or do we deliberately or inadvertently live and tell another gospel? A false gospel just as the Ephesian ear ticklers were doing? Do we add things to the biblical gospel of salvation by grace alone through faith in Christ alone? And it's very easy to add things. Which God do we tell others about? Is it the God of the Bible who is tri-unity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, of whom humanity is made in the image of? Or is it some kind of false God made up in our own imagination? And we've all got very good imaginations, haven't we? And springs from our own thinking. Which Jesus do we confess and live for? Is it the Jesus who was welcoming to all but made demands of them in order to transform them? Such as the rich young ruler who uh, left the short demands made upon him by Jesus? Or the woman at the well who had her sins forgiven but was told by Jesus to stop her lifestyle of sin? Or is the Jesus we share some kind of modern day Jesus who makes no demands at all? And some churches do indeed preach and teach that kind of insipid, 
powerless, nodding head Jesus. I've heard it, and I've walked out, but that may just be me. At least I didn't hackle. <laughs> <laughs> and are we wanting to enjoy all the benefits of being a Christian? Partaking of things such as our salvation, our sins being forgiven, access to the glorious throne of grace, without wanting to enjoy the joy giver, our God who wants to transform us. Transforming us willingly into the image of Jesus Christ, the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, to the glory of God the Father. It's idolatry to want to enjoy those benefits without enjoying and submitting to the benefit giver, the majestic King who is the only true immortal God. It's idolatry because those other things are taking precedence over our worship to the King. Are we taking for granted our salvation? Are we forsaking the meeting together with other Christians when we can do for prayer and worship? And as churches, why are we not doing more together to show people our unity in the Spirit? Because whether we like it or not, we are <coughs> united through the Holy Spirit. And finally, for the rest of us, we need to gather an urgency to tell our communities and our world one person at a time about this great God King. Let's go out of here making a choice to submit to the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, to follow this Jesus closely to the praise and honour of God the Father. Remember, God is personal. He wants relationship. Let his light shine out from us in the places that are in spiritual darkness. We are dying to know personally our majestic King who is God. May his love so shine out of us as we learn and submit to him, loving others, loving each other, to reflect the loving God. Put your thinking and doctrine into practice. For that is evangelism. Evangelism and discipleship are doctrine in practice. They are the outworking of your doctrine. If the God we serve is the God of 1 Timothy, a majestic personal king who is ageless, without decay or corruption, invisible and the only God, then we are duty bound to tell and show others about him. After all, each of us here who are Christians have had somebody tell us about the offer to succumb to the fathomless patience of Jesus and accept him as master of life. Let's go. Are you ready? No, obviously you're sleeping. <laughs> we say say it again. We're English. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that. Yes. Yeah. Even the God of the English. <laughs> Let's close in prayer, and then I'll hand it. Then we'll have a song, and then we'll have a, our prayer time together. Father, we thank you that we can indeed meet together. May your spirit who lives within us remind us not to uh, take this for granted. We know that even people within our own community may want to join us, but are unable to for any number of reasons. May those who are uh, in this community who are housebound or unable to get out for some reason, may they find some way of uh, being contactable by this church. And may we go out uh, preaching and teaching a true gospel and not one of the uh, many false gospels that may be in our imagination. And we thank you that uh, you are a redeeming God and that you entered our time and space as the one who is outside of time and space. And help give us a joy, a joy that is beyond human comprehension, so that people may ask, well, what is so different about you? And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're going to have a song now, uh, 673 I think it is. And then Chris and Sue are going to lead us.
in prayer before our